you and welcome to Lunching with Books. Uh, today we are surely in for a treat. We have Dr. Ed Kroom here who has uh, written an absolutely beautiful book and his photographs are just gorgeous of Roanoke in Oxford. Uh, it seems like so many people today have a condo in Oxford. <laughs> I would like to live at Roanoke if I could. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyway, it's I think he in this book he has truly captured the the beauty of Roanoke and the spirit of William Faulkner. Uh, just a little bit about Dr. Croom. He is a botanist, an ethnobotanist. Is that right? Yes. And uh, he is president of the Croomia Botanical Scientific and Regulatory Consulting. I'm not real sure what that is, no, but. No. <laughs> My wife's just interested in the checks. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, he previously was a full-time faculty member at the University of Mississippi. His work has appeared in the books Herbal and Magical Me Medicine, Taxol, Science and Application, and the Encyclopedia of Dietary Supplements, as well as other uh, various plant science and chemical journals. His photography has been exhibited at the University of Mississippi, the Lauren Rogers, Rogers Museum of Art, and has appeared in USA Today, uh, The Scientist, and the Saturday Evening Post. The Land of Roanoke, this book, an exploration of Faulkner's natural world, has been featured uh, in the Smithsonian Magazine. So anyway, it's, um, it's a beautiful book, and I cannot wait to hear what he has to tell us about the land of Roanoke. Welcome. Thank Andy. you very much. I should say for me, it's an honor to be introduced by someone who uh, has photographed wildflowers and done a book. And uh, this is, I've done book chapters, I've done scientific uh, articles. Uh, the, the, the thing I, I notice now my business is I've done regulatory and scientific work for, for companies. And so, um, but the land of Roanoke uh, <coughs> is, um, grew out of, I moved to Oxford in 1982. So I'm not a native of Mississippi, but all my children are. And uh, so I've been there a long time. As a botanist, I worked in the School of Pharmacy. I worked on plant medicines. I documented plant medicines by living with rural people. I developed Taxol, the cancer drug supplies from ornamental yews. It was from a rare Pacific yew bark. Could not uh, do the world. Now, certainly I work with chemists. I'm a botanist, and, but I figured the strategy of how to have sustainable supplies that could treat the world with Taxol. And that was not true before I, I worked with them on that. Before that, I actually developed the supplies for the World Health Organization of the malaria drug artemisinin, which got the Nobel Prize last year. Now, I didn't get a Nobel Prize. I didn't discover it. The Chinese did. My role in that, as it turns out, is World Health had me direct the production of this malaria drug because the Chinese would not let anybody have it. Okay, the history of artemisinin which is a young person just out of graduate school. I was growing at the Ole Miss Medicinal Plant Gardens with other medicinal plants. And um, it turns out, the true story is, in the Vietnam War, uh, Chairman Mao kept people, they were having a cultural revolution at that time, okay? And so you'd get sent to the countryside if you were a scholar. But if you were working on a new malaria drug for the Vietnamese to be able to beat the Americans, this came out of that program. So sometimes I say good things do come out of bad things. <laughs> and, uh, and that's where it happened. But then later, when they developed this, they would not let the World Health have it. And so I developed the first supplies for the world to treat the malaria that's used all over the world today. So how did I come here? What are the, both of the things I'm telling you have a key thing? I'm very interested in the preservation of plant germplasm and the uses of plants by people and bringing things into cultivation. In um, 2000, I resigned being a full-time researcher. I worked for a company. I worked in uh, New Jersey. Uh, I never saw the earth from uh, November until April. It was all covered with snow where I lived. And so I came back, got a house two or three blocks from Roanoke, 
and started work, walking there is my experience of nature. I was still traveling actually to China and other places in the world. But this was my kind of meditation, my walk in the woods, my morning stroll. I'm a very compulsive scientist on the other part of me. So I'd take a tripod, I would take my camera, and I would shoot pictures really at first just, I'd say, everybody goes to Roanoke, they want to know where's the typewriter and where did he write on the wall? And of course as a botanist, I'm like, I have a living historical landscape that inspired one of our greatest writers. This has many traditional cultivated plant lines there that those of you who have gardened for a long time in Mississippi would know of as far as spireas and things, but not everybody does. So I wanted to show you not a flora, not a technical guide, but the beauty I found in the mystery, really. So it is like my love letter to the place. And so, I had photographed for 10 years before I was happy. Quite honestly, I had a press come to me three years after photograph. I said, no, I really want to show you this place in all its glory. Let me ask y'all, well, people, can we dim the light some of the photographs or is everybody just going to snooze away? And I'll talk louder if you snore. I grew up Presbyterian. I had a sweetest minister in North Carolina where I grew up, but he was very boring and even my father who taught Sunday school would go to sleep during that sermon. So I know this problem. Okay, now if that's too much, you let me know. But I want you to see, this for me as a botanist and photographer was the hardest thing for me to photograph because, you know, it's, it, we just see southern magnolia flowers everywhere. But I'll, I'll say that, uh, so that's the start, because we are in Mississippi and we are where Faulkner lived. I took a few pictures to be black and white, like many traditional photographers, and I'll tell you that this is my 50th year of actually taking photographs, where 50 years ago I learned to develop my film, process in a dark room, use filters for black and white photography, so I had to have a little black and white to say, you know, it's more timeless. So here he was, you can't quite see it here as well as in the book, but it was a beautiful morning fog. I generally walk at War Roanoke shortly after daybreak. I live close to Roanoke. And the way I do that is I hear the birds in the morning. I hear the same birds that are over there. And so a few birds come and then 30 minutes before sunrise, a lot of birds start talking. And when I hear that, I say, Croom, get up, take your shower and go over to Roanoke because nobody is there at daybreak. A lot of people come at lunch in the afternoon. So it was like a retreat. It's like a, a sanctuary that I didn't have to pay for and I don't have to mow the grass. So um, here it is with this cedar walk. I gave, um, I think it might have been at Square Books when I talked about the book. And a lady fresh out of her master gardener's course said, I think I could have done better than those cedars to line the place. And I didn't, of course, insult her by saying anything except, well, that's interesting. Uh, because they lasted since the eight, early 1850s or 1840s. Now, how many trees do you know that? They don't, unlike uh, many trees, drop a bunch of trash. I have a sweet gum tree in my front yard that I just, every time my wife takes a trip, I think I just got to cut this down. You know, because the sweet gum balls fall all over. On the edge of a creek, it's fine, but not in my front yard. I just was mowing them yesterday. And so my point is they've lasted, and they really do give you a great thing. And that's all most people know. Most people don't know the kind of tree. It's an eastern red cedar. I show you this picture of Faulkner. He has a study when you take a tour. That study was not built until the 1950s. Faulkner had very little money most of his life. And until after World War II, when things started to break out again, remember, a lot of his writing was during the Depression. He did not have much money. He wrote in the front room, that's the library, and that's where this picture is taken. And, I, and this is not the typewriter in his study. I used this one in my picture to show you how close he was to the outdoors all the time. This would have been more where he wrote typically 
with the window to his left, a fireplace just above him. This is one of our old homes, you know. I've lived in an old home before. No insulation, drafty. You better not be near the fireplace. He had screens. He never had air conditioning his entire life. One day after his funeral, only one day after his funeral, Estelle, his wife, had an air conditioning unit put in her bedroom. So you could see there was a difference of opinion there, right, of what they do. Hey, and, and this typewriter, why did I put this here? This was his typewriter from writing movie scripts in California. He had to go to California for his day job. That's how he paid for Roanoke. That's why I'm showing you this typewriter. It wasn't his regular writing. It was all those screenplays that he did in California that actually paid for the place. He bought it as in such disrepair. He only paid $6,000 for the place. And then he added the wood some later. And then, but anyway, so he had four acres. And then later he added 29 more acres of woods. I know how much Faulkner... He, he was really a very reticent person, extremely shy person, like you said, and, and would set up an aura that people could have called him count, no count, they could have called him arrogant. But I just, I, if you've really known shy people, and especially, they, they just can't stand that. And I think he was so sensitive. This is what he did later. It was the land itself which owned them, and not just from a planting to its harvest, but in perpetuity. I still see that when I ride through Mississippi, whether it's forest lands or crop lands or whatever. The land is what determines our future here. This is an old cedar in a fire hydrant. And so I put this in to say, I thought it's kind of interesting. What you're gonna find in Oxford, just as a botanist, as a technical side, the woods there, they, they, they control, you don't burn the woods in Oxford like we see in our rural place. So it changes the composition of the woods over time. And so that's why I left that in there to remind me. But this one also looks like it had been hit by lightning. Uh, cedars, I just was uh, showing some ladies from Hot Springs that were a friend of uh, uh, Betty Butler who used to run the, uh, the uh, oh, what's the florist there? I can't even think. But, Right, but I mean, you know, as a matter of fact, Betty's been always a real sweet friend. And, uh, but I'm just saying that, and she said, isn't this, isn't this, isn't this tree going to fall down? I said, <laughs> cedars will just stand and stand. It looks like there's hardly anything left. You don't have to worry about them. Uh, matter of fact, we had Jason, the arborist at Mississippi State, came and looked. He said, yeah, it's not going to fall on anybody. Because, of course, the curator of the place worries about it. What I want to show you in this text, and I'll maybe try to skip through a little bit of it, but if you look at this book, if you look at Roanoke, what you're going to find, here's a quote from him in Flags in the Dust, written in 2627, and I'll comment. It says, the meaning of peace, they turned into an intersecting street, narrow but more shady and even quieter with a golden Arcadian drowse, and drove through a gate. The cinder-packed drive rose in the grave curve between cedars. I'm going to show you some pictures now from that. That's why I'm reading this to you. The cedars had been set out by an English architect of the 40s who had built the house with minor concession of a veranda and the funereal light. And beneath and among them, even on the brightest days, lay a resinous, exhilarating gloom. Mockingbirds loved them and catbirds and thrushes, but the grass beneath them was sparse or not at all, and there were no insects save fireflies in the dusk. Now there's something I'm going to tell you. He didn't buy the place till 1930. He wrote this in 2627. Why do I not care about that? Because as a child, he came up here all the time. And so did Estelle. And so did every other kid in the neighborhood. They would cut through the woods, and there was a, a, a lady, uh, Ellen Bailey, who lived there alone, who painted china lessons for people on the plates, and they would steal fruit from her fruit trees. And they would run through the woods. So they all knew. Every kid nearby knew this place, and so did he and his wife. So he knew this place intimately. 
So notice what I said. We have this drive with a curve, and here is that drive with a curve, okay? And notice how that it's kind of a little bit of a gloom. And at the end of the day, it's definitely gloomy, and I see many fireflies there in the summer in that park. Matter of fact, uh, Dean, who would stay, uh, his, ne his niece, Dean Faulkner Wells, would stay there sometimes. We'd talk about when she'd come there, when they started getting dark, it would get dark so quickly that she would run up to the house and the lights because it was so gloomy and scary. And this is the first light. This is more the times when I'm there more often than any other. When I look at this, you know, good literature and a good landscape, it's both the specific and the general. That scene to me could be in in uh, northern uh, Asia, it could be in Japan on the, on the islands there, it could be in the Pacific Northwest. It's a conifer forest made there. These eastern red cedars were planted there as, as something. They didn't just, they're native to the region, but they wouldn't have grown in this way. So what about other things? What I found in the plants? Okay, it was a summer wisteria, the twilight was full of it. And he talks about, in this text from Absalom, Absalom, I'm going to skip down to saying about what promise, what rat biting fire has the lilac rain of this wisteria, this heavy rose's dissolution crowned. You know, there's something when I read him, I'm going to say that he just, he's magnificent. And I'm going to be honest with you, I had read very little Faulkner until I started walking his place. I learned him through his place. And then I read it this way. And most people, I'm going to tell you, in Oxford have read very little Faulkner. And the one reason I did, they say it's difficult. You can't stand it. So if you're ever tempted to read Faulkner, I'm going to tell you as a latecomer, here's the easiest way to do it. Uh, not like you, Mr. Howell. This is for the, the, the novice, easy guide to get into Faulkner. You read his short stories first. His short stories were written for magazines also to make money. They were very clear. You don't wander all over one place and another. The other way you do it is, I hope since the director of the library is here, I listen to the audio books of Faulkner. I don't know if y'all have them, but they have them in Oxford. And that is the easiest way. You're never confused with a good reader who's speaking and the transition. And I have a, a grandson, and like many grandparents, you've, you've wondered how you could be so goofy about a kid that if it was your own kid, you'd have been a lot more strict. And, and so I listen. I've got grandkids in Chattanooga and in Jackson, so I'm on the road for hours. Well, that's the best way to learn Faulkner to me is get an audio book <laughs> and put it in there. And matter of fact, sometimes I have to stop because he spares nothing, right, of the harshness of life and the way people can treat each other. So, but it's excellent. So here's the Chinese wisteria vine. And this to me again, when I come there, I'm going to tell you what I generally do. I really do use it like uh, we all learn later as a, as a meditation sort of. I stop. It's one reason I use the tripod. It's not just the technical thing. I have to stop physically and look longer. And, and look and, and focus on something and then I practice deep breathing and, and so I take some breaths and I'm there to say what do I see and in that way when I look at this tough vine that, that uh, you don't ever want to have to clear from your property if you've let it overrun that look how tough that is it, and it just reminds me of a tough rural guy and a sinewy kind of all muscle arm I could imagine the guy that some of these guys I've seen out doing pulp wood, they're the strongest guys I've ever seen in my life for the amount of bulk on them. Um, but, and then the flowers come from outside of that strength. They're still there. And here's the, the Chinese wisteria uh, starting in 2004. So I started taking these pictures 2003. The other benefit I found by doing a long time is that I start seeing what's there and maybe what's no longer there, what has disappeared. So outside the window, uh, I'm just going to uh, go through a little bit of this, say he would look down upon Cape Jasmine. Quite honestly, I grew up 
that Cape Jasmine, I would have just always called it gardenia, but a lot of people in this area call it Cape Jasmine. And so I had to learn what they were. And syringa and calicanthus, these are spelled exactly like he spelled them, not necessarily. Syringa was actually uh, uh, um, what we generally call mock orange, okay, in the end days text. It is not, syringa is the genus for lilac. There's no lilac there. There is mock orange there. Now that's a debate. Did he make a mistake? Was it that people there, their local common name, call it there? I can't assure you of that, which it is. The calicanthus doesn't it regularly spell with a Y. And, and so I spelled it because in the book, for every plant I have a picture of, there's an index. And you can look it up if you had read Faulkner of how he spelled it, not how it should have been, because you won't find it. You've got to read it the way he did. So every plant, I tell you the Latin name and look at the uh, common names. And, and then he talks about how that where the moon lay upon their bronze and yet unflowered sleep. Now this is 1929, let's see, he was born in 97, so he was in his early 30s. And you can see that uh, he was still interested in writing about, to me, the young love that people have. So here's the house when you enter there with the gardenia and the cape jasmine in bloom in 2004. So in the book in the front I just tell you the year, but in the back I tell you the exact day things were taken. The southern magnolia and the light after a rainstorm. Realize for me, you'll look at it and you may say, oh I like this picture, I don't like this picture. I stood for 30 or 45 minutes under a shelter for the rainstorm to stop because I wanted one and in the back again it's harder on slides sometimes to see there's this rainy kind of mist in the back and then the light I had to wait for the light to come out and the rain to hit that magnolia flower ironically at the same time uh, I have a my son-in-law's uh, brother was graduating from uh, Tulane and uh, and the speaker there was the Dalai Lama and Dr. John, uh, who's going to be in Oxford at the, the Saturday night, I think, at <laughs> Double Decker. But so, and, and I called my daughter, turns out was there for their future husband. And uh, I said, I just, this wonderful, the light came, the rain parted, you know, the storm went away. And she said, well, the Dalai Lama's there with his little umbrella and the, and the, uh, Dr. John is out here playing his music. So it's just a New Orleans type celebration, right? Everybody seemed to be welcome there. The honeysuckle he wrote about in his book, uh, Gardenia or Cape Jasmine. Uh, when I look at this, I also try to, to do these to show you sometimes flower structures are similar. To me, that could have been a lotus. Uh, some people think it's a magnolia, a small magnolia when they look at it. It is the gardenia or the cape jasmine, however. But can you imagine how many thousands of pictures I had to take to get that one picture where the light, everything was right, and it just was radiant. There's nothing artificial I did to it afterwards. That's just the way it, it really appeared. This is the mock orange or syringa as he writes it. The sweet shrub or calicanthus. Uh, so, I, we got the lawn and the part of the drive. He's talking about in flags in the dust. I'm going back to, you know, he wanted to do flags in the dust early and it came out later. That, that's why I tell you when it wrote, it was written, it was published later because it was way long and the editor says you can't, you can, we just can't use it. But it's one he really liked. The bridal wreath spirea here along the uh, cedar and maiden grass crepe myrtle. Um, the maiden grass wasn't in the others, but the cedar and the crepe myrtle he talks about were overgrown and, and just big as time could make. The same thing he talked about for narcissus, for daffodils. So I'm walking along and I look up and all this is in his writing. Even though people will say, well, it was probably somewhere else. It could have been somewhere else. But what my conclusion at the end was, but this was like his muse. It might have reminded him he was going to place that story in another town, but all this was around him, 
telling him what was there, right? And you could think, oh, I saw this. Oh, remember that scene down at what would be Frenchman's Bend or whatever in a story, right? So it was there. It was like to inspire him. Um, this is one that um, Leela Kelly, and, and Leela, I probably don't ever say your name right. Okay. But she, it just drove me crazy. I sent this picture to her, and I said, what is this? And she said, okay, it, it's so bad. It was so near death. It took her a while to remember it, too. But she said, it's Byzantine gladiolus. And it is. And a matter of fact, now at New Albany, at their garden, they got a huge bed of these. But it's no longer there. So what happened is I was taking <coughs> pictures over time, and what you have to realize is, even though that's at Ole Miss, one of the reasons it came out I did the book is to give you awareness to say it's a treasure and we love it. But there's no funds to take care of those grounds. Zero in the state budget or the university budget. Okay, we have patrons who pay for even the cutting the grass. And so it's all going to be up to us what we want to see in the future of this. And again, I didn't take that as some uh, cause that I had. But after doing it, this is what I found. So he talks about, again, the, this bungalow was bushing crepe myrtle I showed you and syringa and althea almost hidden, save for that through the gap of the study window. This was the disgraced Presbyterian minister's house in uh, light in August. He's talking about his house after he's no longer a minister. And... This is all around. You know, if you read the horticulture books, they'll tell you this Althea Rosa Sharon around. It's a pretty messy shrub, right? It just throws itself out everywhere. So I think it's kind of nice. It's in his writing, but it's also, um, it kind of it fits to me. He built this house for Mammy Callie, uh, Carolyn Barr, who he dedicated one of his books to because she was the black woman who raised him as a child. It was like, you know, his second mother, right? For her to live there, and then caretakers live there. And that's, um, but so this was out for their kind of, um, I, I love uh, these. I think they were beautiful flowers. In the spring, I'm showing you how the spring beauty is just like carpets the place. Uh, this is a, um, I'm trying to think, is that, that is the plum tree at that time? Gosh, I'd have to look it back up. I've got it in there. There is a, a but what I'm going to make a point, let me go on, I'm going to show you, I think, here. This is an Osage orange trunk. Osage orange, a bodark tree. Okay, we're all planted around as fence posts and stuff. They never decay. Guys I know who have made knife and gun handles say you have to do it when the wood is green. Because once it's hard, you can hardly do anything to it. Last forever. I love the character of this one. There used to be another trunk here that when Howard Barr passed curator remembers, he said it was like an artillery shell going off when it fell off. And to me, this is again, you know, you can, you can see faces anywhere, but this is to me almost like some kind of a, a guy holding the world up and here's his big nose and mouth, you know, looking out that way. So I go and uh, kind of uh, give him a nod about every day I go out there. <coughs> so the redbud trees and the house in the morning light, just to show you again, uh, a lot of people come, and let's face it, they're not going to have the time. To me, it's like if I go to a great, beautiful area, gardens, a natural park, I buy a book there, quite honestly, because you can't, you can't take, you haven't <laughs> taken the time and what a person did. The pink flowering dogwood, for me, for my taste, somehow, is, is a very sentimental thing. It just reminds me, I could just see that as a print on a, 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 a delicate scarf or something, or a woman's summer dress. It's just, it's just beautiful, just beautiful. The flowering dogwoods, of course. There was a smokehouse. The original structures there, this was a smokehouse after it was originally a kitchen, right? People had to have a kitchen. So this was back in the 1850s. This would have been built. Along with the house and the log barn, uh, those would have been the original structures there. Again, the fog, you have to be there generally in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, 
fog in our place there, it's gone within an hour or two, right? It's not going to be like parts I've been in <laughs> Oregon or somewhere where it just lasts for hours. This is a muscadine grape arbor. So again, uh, from my point of view and a storyline here, the muscadine vine is no longer there. Now, yes, you can plant another muscadine vine, but why am I interested in more conservation, preservation there? It will never have the same story of if this was William Faulkner's muscadine vine that he made muscadine jelly out of. Okay, you can replace it, but it won't be the same. This is a plum tree, uh, obviously, again, towards the end. In the south, we have a terrible time if you've ever raised fruit trees, right? They are, if you think you can do it without spraying anything or doing anything to them, all I got to say is, well, I want to come see your place. Because uh, over time, they just don't stand up. So there was plum trees there. Uh, let me see, somewhere I've got to have the peach tree, which is now just a stump this high. This is 2004. So what I'm showing you here, and surely, let me see, I've already got it here. Yeah, pecan. So you had nut trees. There's actually a walnut tree there, which I don't have the picture in here, but it's, uh, but we have nut trees. We have fruit trees. There's actually none. We don't know exactly where it was. He had vegetable gardens up to two acres. So he had a mini homestead right there in Oxford. And he had his whole life. And in that log barn that he had, he would have a horse or two horses and a milk cow almost every year in the tiny log barn. Not the new stable that's on the side that looks real pretty. So I say I've got historical landscape plants with our spireas and our ancient trees with our cedars. And we have fruit and nut and, and sometime in the future, I'm sure we can locate where that vegetable garden was. He had, he had the gazebo, we had the flowering dogwood, we have uh, an English boxwood. We do have the same couple, uh, the book for my scotch taste seems expensive because it's $40 with tax, but I can assure you it would have been twice as much. Uh, Evelyn and Michael and Michael Jeffcoat in Laurel, Mississippi subsidized the printing of this book as they did the Eudora Wealthy Garden book before that and they paid, what's reminding me, and they paid for the restoration of, of this gazebo was no longer there and a lower garden. They love literature and they love gardens. So if it's that and you come to them, they are all in. And so I say that so there are people interested. The Azalea Bird Bath uh, and wall, there were azaleas there. On this east side, and I don't have a lot of pictures there, but I'm going to tell you a story that I'm still working on. I'm interested now in finding old descriptions and old um, photographs. Faulkner was so private, he didn't want people taking photographs. But I'm trying to locate those to say what was there more closer to his lifetime. These are 40 to 50 years after his death, so we see what survived that long with minimal care, really. But she had multi-floored roses. The book that I mentioned to you by Malcolm Franklin called Bitterweed. Faulkner hated bitterweed. There's no bitterweed there anymore that grew in the pasture. He would go out and hoe it to either sew up, you either sober up, or if he's writing, quite honestly, all the people I know say he didn't drink much when he was writing. It was only afterwards he would just go on binges and just say, I don't know what to do with my life after this sort of thing, you know? He didn't write that. But he certainly had a crisis. Malcolm Franklin was his stepson, Estelle's son, and he lived there. He loved Faulkner. He ended up, you see him later, he smoked a pipe. He'd wear an old kind of coat like Faulkner did. He became a herpetologist. He wrote some in this book about his childhood, and he talks about, Estelle again, remember, was his mother, that she would have <laughs> peonies there. They're no longer there. I've now found pictures of the peonies from one of the first curators of a pink and a white peony grew there. She grew multicolored roses, some of which they would go to old abandoned house sites and transplant to their place. So he tells me those things. And so I'm interested in what was there because what's going there now has been shaded some 
because things have come up. The cedar trees aren't called the Seymour shade. Their shade goes up and up and up the older they get. And so there's, there's some trees that have gotten bigger that I think need to be done back. Why? Because I'm just as interested that Estelle who lived there, story is told too. She was a southern lady who had her cutting garden. And, and he talks about she had lady banksia roses and multicolored roses and peonies. She would cut and bring into her dinner table, right? So she's just been forgotten. Well, I think she's well worth remembering. Any woman who could live with William Faulkner for that many years <laughs> deserves a medal and bouquets and a lot of recognition. This is the old rose and the garden bench. Uh, I recently heard a story that, that the garden bench was actually uh, taken by Jill and some guy from the university was stolen and somehow brought over there. I don't know if it's true or not. The rose bush in the fog, the Chinese wisteria fruit, uh, the view from house from the sunken garden I mentioned because the Jeff Coates that I mentioned to you restored this with the steps. I think it's one of the better things. Most people just take their picture in the front. But here you've got the woods and the grounds and the house. And this is the sunken garden that they just paid, a, uh, well, in 2015. I would have taken the picture right after it was done. The paddock and business and buildings at Sunset. I do come back in the afternoon because if you get into photography, it's really true. Your best light is within two hours of daybreak and within two hours before sun is set. And so I had to come back to show you that beautiful golden uh, color that comes there. This is the horse stable. Again, this was built in the 50s. Again, no money until the mid 50s. Did he really have enough to do anything? So this, he loved to jump horses, this beautiful pecan tree that swept over now. The wind has cleared most of that top. It won't last much longer. Um, wild grapevine, just kind of the whimsy. Persimmon flowers, but I've never found a female with any persimmons. And I love persimmons. It's my favorite fruit in the whole world. And uh, the wild grapevine in the fog, this was used like for the cover. The fog in Bailey's woods, I'm showing us that even though these woods are kind of sparse uh, in the amount that's there and have small seedlings, there are always a beautiful fall colors and there's moss above the ravines which gave part of the privacy. One reason one of those woods is nobody else was going to be walking up in there except for little boys, you know, and he could shoo them away. The north pasture, dark clouds, I just point out, y'all know this, but when I go other places, we have storms here. <laughs> and that even sometimes the snow, and I include uh, more snow pictures because we don't have it very much. And again, to me, this could be where the, the snow monkeys are in Japan or something, those conifer forests, you know? And uh, you can tell, if you haven't told by now, I'm just a little boy who's curious and I love to dream and uh, just walk around in a certain sweetness that doesn't always happen with other human beings, to be honest. And uh, so the house and the seat lawn walk. So I understand that part of him. He had to have his privacy. Now I call. I, I'd like you to confirm. This is what I call a naked ladies, and 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 a lot of people now today they'll call that naked ladies, and it drives me crazy. I said, which flesh tone do you see to call it naked ladies? I see it in this one, if there's any basis of it, and. Uh, so in the back, just to, to tell you what else I added at the end of the book, we have a map and it tells you where every photograph is in general, okay? Like it's in the north lawn or the southeast lawn. So every photograph, every plant, I tell you where it is. I think that life goes on like the cedar and this Virginia creeper and to show you this wonderful uh, thing and, and I'll just, I will take part of this. Faulkner wrote this early, talking about his poems, which were not well accepted. He said, I'm a failed poet, so I became a novelist, right? And a short story writer. And he says, I think if you had an epitaph for me, it would be there. If there be grief, but let it be but rain, and this but silver grief, for grieving's sake. And if these green woods be dreaming here to wake, within my heart, if I should rouse again, but I shall sleep. For where is any death, while in these blue hills slumberous overhead, I'm rooted like a tree, though I be dead. This earth that holds me fast will find me breath. I think it's one of the best uh, poems he did, right, about his own life. 
I can tell you to make this. I had to have help from the curator, the director of the museum. Again, I am not a big one on planning. I'm a big one on living your life however it comes to you. After 10 years, I said, I think I want to do a book. I went to the director of the museum and I said, could I do a book? And, and this is when I knew I'd left the science world and John gone into the art world because he said, we want you to do a museum exhibit because these are stunning. In my entire scientific career, I've never written the word stunning and I've never seen it written by any other scientist. <laughs> so I said, Kroom, you are in a different world now. The world of superlatives, right? And so, but anyway, so it was great. Now, why did that matter? It turns out by having the show that Jeff Coates somehow heard, the university didn't tell him, that I was giving this lecture on the show. And they came and they said, we love what you did. We're going to pay for the publication of this book. Okay, and therefore the book price would be the same as the one they had down there, about half. Um, and so I do dedicate it to William Faulkner. As, as y'all have said, there are many condos there. I can't imagine what it'd be. He had 29 acres of woods and four acres of cultivated. Uh, it would not be this woodland sanctuary with historic landscape plants in the middle of Oxford. That would not be there. And also the Jeff Coates, because they are interested in supporting this and uh, for what they've done. And there, I always try to, I hope I finished in time for y'all, right? So you wouldn't have to worry. And that's it. Oh, well, sure. And I understand if somehow you have to you don't have parking meters, thank God, here. But in Oxford, now you have to worry about your parking meter running out. Sure. What about the cedar trees? How old are they? They would have been planted around that time. I haven't tried to core them. It's hard to core cedar trees, but there actually is one stump there on the ground that I must say I haven't done it yet, but i got to count those rings. I think I think they're from the 1850s. Most of them. There are a few that died over time due to an ice storm in '94 or whatever. Right? They're that old. 1850s. Sure. No, no, no. They were doing that on their own, and um, you know who's uh, there's a. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. I, I did. You know the you know the people who they did yeah. No, no, no. no. <coughs> They're perfectly capable. I saw all those clippings and what. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Okay. So they wanted to hear the the question that you had. Uh, so she was asking the age of the cedar trees, and I told her I can't give you definitive proof, but it would have been around that 1850s, I think, for most of them. Um, there's few smaller that have been replaced, and I know from, you know, probably our first major ice storm in Oxford in 1994, there were probably some before that you lost them. The cedars, if you go there, which I didn't show you in that, are along the whole drive, and there's that circular garden that's in the front that's been allowed things to grow up, and cedars surround that. And they're starting now to cut the privet, which is one of the things that uh, I recommended to them, and they wanted to do it so they could see where people park. Um, there's cedars that used to line that road too, and there's cedars that go to the back. So there was obviously a carriage uh, horse trail that went to the back for deliveries, a one to the front to get out when you were formally invited, right? And uh, to go around the uh, things. So here's the difference. I showed you this uh, briefly, the picture of the one with the azalea. That wall was built by Faulkner with maybe some help. And uh, Malcolm White, uh, not Malcolm White, uh, Malcolm Franklin, talks about gathering big swarm for a penny piece. If you go over there, you're going to notice it is the sloppiest, crookedest, uneven wall you've ever seen. You would never want to pay him to do it. And why did I mention that? If you look at the house that Shegog did, that formal circular maze garden, even if it's grown up, Shegog did everything perfect, well laid out. 
Faulkner, also there's a rose garden there that there are not any roses right now, it's overgrown privet hedges, but it can be restored. And what I mentioned that, he built that office that you'll see when Estelle had gone to Europe. Uh, obviously he did that for a reason, right? Those of you who have had a long-term relationship, he didn't have to ask any permission. So she came back and was obviously pretty upset that she had lost her garden to his office. <coughs> So he built her this rose garden that's now a privet circular thing up there to appease her. But again, it is the sloppiest on the slope. If you hired a horticulturist today to do that, you would, you would be, you, you'd just be unhappy. And uh, so, and I think it makes sense. I'm not unsympathetic to him. I think he was a true genius. And he preserved everything he could his time to write and he did have duties to take care of his, of whether it was Dean, his niece, because he always felt guilty that his brother Dean had died in an airplane accident, right, when he was young. And he, as the oldest son, felt like he had to take care of these people. And so he had to make money when he really didn't want to make money. He wanted to be a literary artist, right? And literary artists, they want to do what they want to do. Same as painters, right? So he did a lot. And I'm sympathetic with that. I'm sorry that he and Estelle's childhood romance obviously was, was just full of conflict their whole life. They weren't, that there wasn't more happiness there. So, um, but anyway, I hope you can see that what I've tried to show you is if you read Faulkner, or if you're interested, if you go there now, you can see he had, he preserved an entire world from the past, just like he says the past wasn't the past. He was showing you what his world, when growing up his mother canned, you know, jams and, and vegetables and fruits and nuts. He had to go out in the woods, it was recorded by one of his brothers, to go out and there was some wild, a few wild walnut trees in the woods and, and there were these pecan trees here and hickory nuts, and they would gather hickory nuts. Most people don't still know how to gather here. And they would roast hickory nuts and walnuts from the woods. So they knew they, they did it every fall. They did it every time they were falling. So he, he's preserved a lot of that, right? And there are hickories on the property as well as the, the walnut uh, tree. I think, I think he preserved a lot. It's, and again, I want to make it clear, I did not start out with that mission but just after being there for a decade, I could see all the things he had done and lived with, right? You've been a wonderful, attentive audience, and I want to thank you for asking me to come be with you. And there are beautiful books for sale, so you don't have to worry. That's right, that Reeves is doing. And, and we, have a, we have a special guest, a fourth conference of right now, Dr. Lee the Fifth. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.